good evening all it's indeed a pleasure for me to introduce today's speaker uh, he's very distinguished faculty in the field of uh, nuclear medicine and dr uh, uh, kartikeyan ananta subramanian is a professor of medicine at wayne state university and director of nuclear cardiology and if i start listing out his achievements and his uh, honors the whole session also would be uh, falling short of his achievements uh, to list a few he is one of the best uh, teachers uh, awarded more than eight times and uh, he is uh, one of the top docs in the speciality of cardiology by the detroit uh, r magazine and he is very enthusiastic about exercising movies and he is he's very passionate about table tennis and today he will be enlightening us about uh, cardiac uh, pet ct and uh, it's uh, i i invite everyone of the audience to uh, kindly listen to whatever he's saying and uh, mute yourself and then whatever questions throw it in the chat box and later on we'll have a 15 minutes uh, question session and uh, i welcome dr kartikeyan anand subramanian for the session good evening sir uh thank you sudhir and uh, um Thank you, uh, Josna and Saima, for the invitation and all the details uh, uh, for this opportunity. Um, uh, so my goal here over the uh, next, uh, hopefully, like about fifty minutes or so, so that we have time for questions, is to is to kind of give an overview of uh, um, cardiac pet and how we use it clinically and uh, um, and how where where I see it actually going. So here, I mean, I don't have any relevant disclosures except that. Obviously, I'm pretty passionate about PET, uh, and uh, you know I am in the executive council for the ASNIC uh, Society. So we'll kind of try to cover these where we briefly address as we talk about PET, its relationship to coronary atherosclerosis and physiology. Uh, I mean, for the audience here, I understand many of you are already qualified physicians practicing, so some of it may be a little bit basic of PET technology and isotopes, why I feel PET is better than SPECT, uh, role in CAD and particularly focus on flow and flow reserve, which we use a lot in cardiac PET. And then we can definitely touch on viability and sarcoid and some emerging applications. So we all know that uh, uh, PET is a unique technology where um, positron decays into a, uh, a neutron and then in that process releases a positron and um, uh, neutrino. So the positively charged electron meets its counterpart and generates two 511 keV photons, which are detected by PET through a mechanism of coincidence detection. So the unique aspects of PET are uh, the fact that its isotopes, you capitalize on the commonly found elements in the human body and uh, is able to study the molecular physiology to a great extent. So this is kind of an important um, curve, which uh, we discuss all the time during our teaching sessions for the trainees to, uh, to kind of understand the physiology of blood flow, where flow is illustrated in the x-axis and activity is illustrated in the y-axis. So an ideal radio tracer would follow the line of linearity, and uh, we can see that O15 water, which is really not widely used clinically, is probably the best tracer to come close to the line of linearity. When we look at SPECT, one and one aspect of why PET would be better than SPECT is we all struggle with SPECT in daily life because of the fact that we don't have an isotope which really tracks blood flow very well. And most of the currently utilized SPECT isotopes um, actually track blood flow maybe up to a maximum of around two ml per minute per gram. After that, they actually plateau off. And what does this mean clinically is that despite an increase in myocardial blood flow, you are not able to achieve a corresponding increase in isotope uptake. So mild to moderate coronary disease is routinely missed on SPECT imaging. Uh, SPECT is very good in picking up significant disease, but when you have mild to moderate atherosclerosis, you can see why SPECT would underestimate it because it just doesn't track blood flow well. Relatively speaking, thallium is a little better, but the PET isotopes definitely uh, you know, are superior to SPECT isotopes in tracking blood flow well, ammonia being obviously better than rubidium. Um, now, why do, uh, why do I think PET uh, is better than SPECT? 
Um, uh, I, I obviously expect we face daily challenges in patient body habitus. Now I can tell you for those of us who practice in the United States, obesity is a huge epidemic and a problem. Michigan is uh, ranks among the top five in the country in obesity. And so we deal with attenuation and poor image quality with SPECT, despite using routine attenuation correction for all of our patients. And then most of the technician-based isotopes struggle with intense extra cardiac activity, which interferes with uh, image reprocessing. Now, the SPECT diagnostic accuracy is pretty good. We've all used SPECT for over five to six decades, and it stood the test of time in being able to predict low and high risk. But the false positive rates remain high because of uh, image quality issues, um, uh, attenuation artifacts, mimicking um, defects, et cetera. It still struggles with detection of multivessel disease. It's not a huge problem as people try to make it out, but I think about 5% of patients, we may miss truly balanced ischemia, which we don't have a way of figuring it out at this time with regular anger camera spec. Then prolonged acquisition is an issue, relatively high radiation burden, and we really don't have ways of documenting flow. Uh, and this, in combination with the inferior tracking of uh, blood flow, poses a significant problem in quantitation of blood flow with SPECT. Now, that is changing. As you all, uh, I'm sure, are aware, the newer cameras, particularly the, um, the digital or the CZT uh, solid-state cameras, because of the high sensitivity and good energy resolution, they are able to acquire much greater counts and spec blood flow is becoming a reality with the newer cameras. And then if you look at just comparison of clinicians reading PET versus SPECT, you can see that 90% of the PET studies compared to about 20% of the SPECT studies are rated as good. So just the image quality is better, which makes clinician accuracy for interpretation much better. And then if you look at by gender, by BMI, or in detection of multivessel disease sensitivity, PET is superior to SPECT. PET here is shown in red and SPECT is shown in blue. So when we look at sensitivity for PET, we, we've talked about high myocardial extraction. We've, we've briefly touched on the fact that we can quantitate blood flow, but we're going to get into it more. And PET brings other advantages in the sense that we are able to truly measure a stress ejection fraction with PET. Just because of the short uh, half-life of PET isotopes, we actually image at peak hyperemia compared to SPECT, where after we inject the patient, we have to wait 45 to 60 minutes to actually image. So we never truly get a true stress EF with PET, uh, with SPECT, but we get a true stress EF with PET. So the difference between stress and rest EF with PET is called EF reserve, and a drop in ejection fraction reserve is associated with a higher incidence of multivessel disease. So all of these combinations lead to superior sensitivity of the modality. When you look at specificity, robust attenuation correction, as we all know, PET cannot be read without AC. So attenuation correction is routine with PET. But the scatter correction is very robust. And the spatial resolution is around 4 to 6 millimeters compared to SPEC, which is about 10 to 13 millimeters. So the combination of all of this leads to superior specificity. So you really don't sacrifice either sensitivity or specificity with PET, and in, in general, it, it is definitely superior to SPECT. And then looking at from radiation standpoint, because obviously as low as reasonably achievable is important, as an set a goal of less than nine millisieverts for 50% of the studies. Unfortunately, I don't think many labs in the US achieve that at this time because they routinely do the rest and stress protocols. And as you can see here, that leads to about 11 millisieverts. In our lab, it's about 9.6 millisieverts. But in our lab, when we do PET imaging, we are between two to four millisieverts, depending on if we add a calcium score or not. Um, and so you can see dramatic reductions in um, uh, PET radiation. And due to the very short half-life of the PET isotopes, there's virtually no radiation exposure to the staff. So how do we approach in Henry Ford uh, PET imaging? So obviously we use appropriate criteria. So we tell our trainees uh, and uh, nurses who triage our patients' requests. First, if a patient is referred for a perfusion scan, number one is the scan appropriate to do for that patient. Can we do another test without radiation so that the patient doesn't need to have radiation? If there is no, if no other test is better than a nuclear scan, the next question we, we want them to ask is, can, my, can the patient exercise? If the patient can exercise, 
then we recommend doing a spec scan. And you all know the reason for that is because we cannot do exercise with PET as yet. I think that's going to change in the next two years. But currently, PET is all pharmacological stress. So if a patient uh, is appropriate for a nuclear scan and the patient can exercise, a spec would be a good start because the exercise data is valuable. But if the patient cannot exercise and you have a PET camera in your facility, those patients should definitely get PET. Uh, I do not order any pharmacological spec scans at all. Um, all. All of my patients who need a chemical stress test get a PET scan. Why is that? You can see at the bottom the tremendous advantages when you look at PET over spec. Uh, we've talked about perfusion. We've talked about EF. Um, and uh, the other nice things we get with PET CT, and we do, obviously, we do, we have a CT along with PET. Um, you can get coronary calcium information which adds value in atherosclerosis and ischemia imaging. And finally, uh, you know, how do we truly know that a patient responded to vasodilator stress? It's pretty challenging to figure that out with SPECT imaging. Whereas with PET, looking at blood flow, looking at EF rise, all of it gives us clues that the patient indeed responded to the vasodilator. Now, I touted the advantages of PET, but where is PET weaker than SPECT? Obviously, cost is a big issue, right? So if we wanted a cyclotron and the entire setup for a pet, that would be about easily about $2.5 million in the United States or more. Um, if we wanted to run a generator with rubidium, which is what we do, we're looking at about $35,000 every six weeks for a new generator. So the key thing for a program to decide if they're going to go to pet or not is number one, do we have the patient population? Can we generate enough volume so that we can uh, either cut even or move towards a, a profitable thing. So uh, that, you know, you have to kind of work with your administrators to figure that out. And I can tell you personally, it took me four and a half to five years to start the pet program at Henry Ford because I had to prove to the administration that it was cost beneficial to do pet um, and make money. Uh, and then uh, what about information on prognostic value? I think uh, obviously SPECT has very rich data but PET is rapidly catching up. There is numerous studies published. I'll show you a few of them showing the value of PET uh, in decision-making for cardiac catheterization, angioplasty, or even prognosis. Now, and the final disadvantage of PET is it cannot provide exercise data. But I think that's going to change with this exciting uh, advance which is happening. And those of you who were able to uh, either watch ASNIC a meeting recently concluded at the Toronto Center. Uh, we presented the, um, uh, not presented, we talked about the phase three, second, uh, second phase three trial being completed for fluperidase. Dr. Madahi presented that. And the, the, the isotope F18 fluperidase is now going to be under FDA review. And I truly believe that it will probably get approved by the end of next year or early 2025 which can then make the option of exercise PET a true reality. So with that introduction about why PET is better than SPEC, let's look at the value of PET and CAD. So if you look at this uh, meta-analysis uh, published many years ago, you can see that the pool sensitivity and specificity for PET compared to SPEC, red, in, red for PET and uh, yellow at uh, bars for SPEC showing clearly better sensitivity and specificity for PET. Uh, and there's really no need to sacrifice either sensitivity or specificity, which is very important. And most recently, if you look at data like this coming from the Kansas City group led by uh, Dr. Patel, if you actually take patients with PET and SPECT and you classify them as low-risk scans versus high-risk scans, you can see that a low-risk PET leads to less catheterizations and less revascularization compared to a low-risk SPECT. On the other hand, a high risk PET leads to more appropriate catheterizations and more appropriate revascularizations compared to a high risk SPECT. So decision making between low and high risk PET helps to guide angiography and revascularization better than SPECT. So how do we do uh, cardiac PET at Henry Ford? We use regadinocin for all our vasodilator stress. Our timing of the entire scan is totally about 30 minutes. Uh, we don't routinely do coronary calcium scores for all of them just because of time limitations and number of patients we do, but that's an option available with our scanner. But our times 
for past testing is so short, right? So if you look at a spec scan, it takes about three and a half hours. So patients love it. And once they've had a PET scan, they never go back to a SPECT. What are the indications we use PET for? I've listed it here. Many are familiar to you and we don't need to go through all of this, but I'll point out a couple of them, which I think is important. Um, I think the biggest bang for the buck for PET is comes with, uh, with very obese patients where SPECT really struggles. So typically when we have body mass indexes greater than 35, those patients we preferably send to PET. The other area where I think PET can be utilized more is in patients with paced rhythm or left bundle branch block, where due to multiple reasons, including partial volume averaging, you can get defects in SPECT, uh, both at rest and stress. And so a PET with its superior resolution has minimal to no defects in most of the cases. So it's very useful. And then the other reasons which we talked about is identification of disease and viability. So here's an, here's a, we'll go through an example of a normal PET scan. You can see uh, it's very similar to a spec scan. The perfusion is normal. The gated study is normal, but the added advantage as we talked about the ejection fraction stress is higher than the rest. And so that combined with flow, which is, and we use flow reserve of two as our lower limits of normal helps to give you a true confidence that you're dealing with a low risk scan. So if you look at this patient who's a 59 year old coming in with atypical chest pain with multiple risk factors, undergoing a regadinosin stress, you can see that this perfusion scan is normal. Your ejection fraction at rest is 56%, rises to 62%. So your, you can see that your EF reserve is about six points, which is very good. And then we do dynamic flow imaging where we, uh, we basically calculate blood flow uh, by looking at a single compartmental model, looking at blood pool um, uh, rubidium versus myocardial uptake of rubidium. So here is an example of dynamic acquisition um, happening. And then you can see that because of the robust correction methodology in PET, the higher energy, the coincidence detection, uh, we are able to convert counts into flow as ml per minute per gram. So for example, in this patient, you can see the patient's resting blood flow is a little bit on the higher side. Typically we would say uh, the normal range is about 0.7 to 1.1 ml per minute per gram, but regardless, it's, it's normal to high. And then with stress, you can see that the patient significantly increases their blood flow. They more than double their blood flow from rest to stress, which then helps you to look at the flow reserve, which is your stress flow divided by rest flow, which is all normal. So this gives you true confidence that a normal perfusion scan with a normal peak flow and normal flow reserve is truly a low risk scan. And here is a data um, from uh, multiple studies from Dr. Dikale and others showing that the normal range of myocardial flow reserve, but these are just no, keep in mind that these are young people. So there is an age dependent drop in uh, flow in PET, something to keep in mind. So the flow reserve in a 20-year-old is going to be much higher than a flow reserve in a 70-year-old. But with all of that said, the lower limits of normal of flow reserve is around two. And so less than two is considered abnormal flow reserve. So when you take flow reserve into consideration, the biggest advantage of flow, uh, a flow reserve is in its negative predictive value. What do I mean by that? So if you have a normal perfusion scan and a normal flow reserve, you have a very high negative predictive value for low risk for event traits. And we put that in our report. We basically say the in the setting of normal perfusion, a normal myocardial flow reserve is associated with very low risk of cardiovascular events. You can see that the positive predictive values are not too great. And you may wonder, geez, that's pretty low. Well, but remember that all of us who practice nuclear cardiology <coughs> hear this from our referings. We call something abnormal. They, the referings send the patient for a cat and the cat may not show something. And then they will immediately say, oh, that's a false positive. That may be true, but remember that that is called referral bias, right? If you look at how the referring patterns for nuclear imaging is, people seldom send a negative scan for cat. Less than 3% of scans in the United States nationally, which is normal, go for CAT because people are very confident. Oh, it's a normal scan. I don't need to CAT this patient. Whereas people send abnormal scans selectively to CAT. So right away you have a referral bias. So 
that referral bias of sending only abnormal scans to CAT is going to drop your uh, specificity and positive predictive value. So now, not only does flow give you low risk of events, flow helps flow reserve helps helps to guide patient management. So this is again data from the Kansas City group, and all of you would be familiar. Those of you who read cardiac studies will be familiar with a similar diagram published over twenty years ago from uh, the Cedar Sinai group, which showed that uh, ischemia on the x-axis and events on the y-axis. And typically, all of us utilize the cutoff of 10% of ischemia. So if a myocardium has got greater than 10% ischemia, it's better to consider CAT. If they have less than 10% of ischemia, which is considered low amount of ischemia, it's better to treat them with medical therapy. The same thing has been now reproduced with PET flow reserve. So if you look at flow reserve here on the x-axis, death on the y-axis, you can see that this blue line, which is medical therapy, red line, which is revast, cross around the 1.8 mark. Um, and you can say 1.8 versus 2. You could use either one of the two. But the, but the thought process here is, if a patient has got normal flow reserve, which is anything greater than 1.8 or, or 2, unnecessarily subjecting them to cardiac catheterization causes higher event rates. Because we already know they are low risk. Why do we need to take the patient and do a cat? So it's better to treat them with medical therapy when their flow reserves are good. And it's when your flow reserves are abnormal, you can see that these are the patients who have lower event rates with CAT compared to medical therapy. So you can see that utilizing flow reserve helps to guide management. So the way I, I tell my uh, colleagues who refer patients is if I'm calling a PET scan abnormal with a perfusion bur burden, ischemic burden of 6%, but the patient's flow reserve is two, I would say treat that patient medically. But if I'm calling someone with the uh, ischemic burden of, let's say, 10%, and the flow reserve is 1.6, that's a patient with a higher risk. I'm not saying they should immediately cat them, but that should be in the thought process. And so multiple studies have shown that MFR or CFR, if you want to call it, myocardial flow reserve or coronary flow reserve, whichever terminology you want to use, has independent prognostic value, regardless of the way you slice and dice the data. What about an abnormal scan? So we talked about normal scan, prognostic value, et cetera. The abnormal scan is an abnormal scan. It shows perfusion defects. You may have TID. Your ejection fraction can drop. You can have all motion abnormalities. Plus, your blood flow may be abnormal, too. And so when you look at this EF reserve concept, which I talked about, this is data coming from Brigham a uh, group from Dr. Dorbala's lab showing that if you look at the left side, this is a scan result and this is the EF reserve. You can see that when you have a very abnormal scan, these patients may have minimal to no increase in uh, uh, change in ejection fraction and these patients will have a drop in EF actually. And when you then take that to cardiac catheterization, you can see a drop in LV stress EF is associated with a higher risk of left main and multivessel disease. So here again, PET gives you that added advantage of being able to pick up that balanced ischemia or multivessel disease by not only looking at perfusion and flow, but also by looking at EF. So here is a scan from our, in, from our lab, 74-year-old female with shortness of breath and palpitations. Clearly, you can see an infralateral perfusion defect, which looks like single vessel disease ischemia. The rest of the perfusion is normal. The coronary calcium analysis shows significant calcium in the LAD uh, at, at this particular point. And so when we look at the patient's ejection fraction, resting EF was 57%. The stress EF did not increase. It went down <coughs> to 55%. So that itself was a little bit concerning. We are having only single vessel ischemia, yet the ejection fraction is dropping. But then when we look at flow, you can see this patient also has elevated resting blood flow, but they are not able to double their blood flows very well. You can see that their blood flows, stress blood flows are on, are the absolute value is normal, maybe only in the LAD at most, but even then the reserves are all abnormal. We talked about a flow reserve of two or greater being uh, normal, right? So the reserve in every territory is abnormal. So the combination of a drop in EF, coronary calcification, drop a, a, a reduction in peak flow and flow reserve raises the concern for multi-vessel disease. 
And so this patient was called as suspicious for multivessel disease. Cardiac catheterizations actually showed multiple LAD lesions, 60%, along with significant diagonal disease, tight branch, LPL branch of the circ, and diffuse disease in the right coronary artery. Now, we'll look at this uh, case. This is a case which is very abnormal. We can clearly see a large amount of ischemia in the inferior and uh, maybe uh, inferolateral wall. Um, you can see the ejection fraction dropped again, 54 to 50%. Um, this patient's flow here, normal resting flows. Uh, and you can see that the LAD flow doubles. So why am I pointing out this is because by looking at peak flow, you can decide if a patient has obstructive epicardial disease or not. So when I look at the scan, I can tell the referring, you know what, I don't think there is obstructive disease in the LAD because resting flows are normal and the flow doubles. So when your absolute peak flow exceeds 1.8 ml per minute per gram and there is doubling of flow, it's unlikely that you have obstructive disease in the LAD. Whereas if you look at the circumflex and the right, there is severe, particularly right, there is a drop in stress flow, very severe reduction in flow, matching this large amount of ischemia that you're seeing. And the flow reserve globally is abnormal. So here is the cardiac catheterization data. Just like we called, there was only moderate disease in the LAD, nothing significant. The right had 99% stenosis and the circumflex had no stenosis. Well, then let's go back and see so if the circumflex had no stenosis, why was the peak flow not, uh, you know, not very high? And why was the flow reserve abnormal? And this is where uh, the uh, PET has to be complementary to CAT. So PET is very good in saying that the scan is completely normal. But when you have these kinds of mild reduction in flows, you really need cardiac catheterization or CT data to say if it's obstructive disease or diffuse atherosclerosis. So the way I would interpret this after getting the cath result would be to say, it's most likely that the circumflex has diffuse atherosclerosis, which can cause a reduction in flow without obstructive disease. Now, moving on from epicardial disease is microvascular disease. I, as you know, microvascular dysfunction is substantially prevalent. The most recent CORMICA trial, which was an invasive study, showed that up to 50% of patients actually had microvascular dysfunction. So these are patients who have chest pain, they have abnormal stress tests, you cat them or do CTA, they don't have any disease, yet they have abnormal tests and chest pain. So the disease must be coming from somewhere else. And the, my, and the assessment of microvascular dysfunction has been a challenge, but now PET has really replaced that void and it's considered the non-invasive gold standard for estimating it. So here's the criteria we use for microvascular dysfunction. And so if you look at uh, the types of microvascular dysfunction. And the reason I show this is for those of you who interpret PET, I think it's important to understand that PET is, gives you insights into multitude of flow abnormalities. So if you take the left top corner, this is a normal patient. You have normal stress flow, normal rest flow, flow reserve is normal. This is your classic patient with microvascular dysfunction. And when I say that, that is because this patient doesn't have, these patients should not have any obstructive CAD, right? So you have to make sure that you've cat them or done CTA, proven that they have nothing else. And then uh, look at this. The other way to look at this would be, if you don't want to do that, is that the perfusion is completely normal. So the perfusion is completely normal. The EF is normal. There's no TID, yet their stress flows are low and their MFR is low. So you could then say, well, maybe it's related to microvascular dysfunction. But the best way to to truly diagnose microvascular dysfunction is to exclude epicardial disease confidently. Then you can put the PET data into perspective. Now, what is interesting, which I see that many clinicians are not aware, even cardiologists find it, uh, find it as a slightly different concept is coming to this side. This is called endogenous type of dysfunction, which PET can help to uh, show. So what does that mean? That means what happens is these patients have reduction in stress flow, they have a reduction in rest flow. So, but because your CFR is a ratio, the CFR appears normal. So if your CFR is normal, is that mean that they have um, better prognosis like we talked about? Uh, you know, yes and no, meaning they are okay, but they're not as good as this patient because their stress flows and rest flows are lower somewhat, but they're not very high risk. Now, these, this group of patient is what I showed before. They have high resting flows. So which means when 
they are not able to increase their flow as much. So the stress flows are normal, but because their rest flows are elevated, your MFR drops. So this is called endogenous microvascular dysfunction, which PET can help distinguish. So I'll show you two cases to uh, from my clinic to say uh, to uh, kind of help to differentiate this. So this patient was called microvascular dysfunction by, uh, by many folks. She's got a positive treadmill. She has near normal coronary arteries on CTA with some scattered atherosclerosis and continues to have recurrent episodic chest pain. Uh, and so they said, well, this is probably microvascular dysfunction. The pain was classically like Prince metal angina, like vasospastic. So we brought her to the PET lab and we did flows. And look at her flows. Her resting flows are all elevated and her stress flows are excellent. She's able to more than double from rest to stress. And so her flow reserves are completely normal and her perfusion is normal. So this cannot be microvascular dysfunction, right? Because she's able to mount good flows uh, and her flow reserves are normal. So this is most likely vasospastic variant angina. On the, on the other hand, look at this patient of mine, 66 year old with morbid obesity, exercise intolerance and anemia. Echo shows grade one diastolic dysfunction and echo shows high stroke volume and cardiac output. We, uh, we, because she was so obese, we just took her for cat because she was having consistent symptoms. Cat essentially showed just minimal luminal irregularities, but she continued to have intolerance to exercise and chest discomfort. So we assessed for microvascular dysfunction. So look at her analysis here. Her resting flows are very elevated. Her peak flows are normal because they're all about two, but her flow reserves are abnormal. And so if I go back to the previous diagram, she falls into this category where she's got elevated resting flow, normal stress flow, but myocardial flow reserve is low. So she has endogenous microvascular dysfunction. So you can see how PET analysis helps you to differentiate that. One of the big areas where we are a transplant center, we are really uh, utilizing more and more PET and uh, is in detection of cardiac allograft vasculopathy. As you all, uh, those of you who are aware of the uh, this problem or deal with these patients, no, it's a very challenging diagnosis to make. Many of these patients have to get cats to routinely, exposure to radiation and contrast. And regular stress tests are, in my opinion, useless. Uh, they have very low sensitivity and specificity. Um, and so PET with flow serves as a great way. And so this is a 44-year-old male with heart transplant, a new diastolic dysfunction on echo sent for cardiac PET. You can see that the resting flows are normal to borderline elevated. There is kind of diffuse blunting of stress flows. So you can see particularly LAD and CIRC, it's, it's not above 1.8 to 2 ml per minute per gram and your reserve is abnormal. So you can see global MFR is, is decreased. And so your uh, peak myocardial blood flow global is 1.6. Just keep this in mind. EF is 60% and your MFR is low. So how do you use this data to make the decision for allograft vasculopathy? So this is a very nice uh, study and algorithm proposed by Paco Bravo uh, use, uh, in cardiac transplant patients. And this is what we use. So if you look at perfusion, so if your perfusion is normal, which in this patient, the perfusion was normal, right? So let's come down the graph. What is the peak blood flow? The peak blood flow in our patient was 1.6. So it's actually reduced. So it falls into this category. Then we look at ejection fraction. If your EF is above 45%, this is mild coronary allograft vasculopathy. If your EF is lower than 45%, this may be more advanced vasculopathy. If your perfusion is normal, peak flow is normal, highly unlikely to have vasculopathy. So, uh, so this has actually been subsequently validated in other groups and shown to have value. So the transplant folks like this a lot because it saves them trouble from having to cat or do CTA unless there is a, still a very high clinical suspicion. Obviously, on the right side of it, this is obviously abnormal because there are perfusion defects, and then you can utilize the flow to decide whether it's single vessel or multi-vessel disease. So in summary, if you look at PET for coronary disease, it's outstanding, right? You can, you can detect completely normal epicardial arteries and microcirculation. You can detect epicardial coronary artery disease with obstruction, with preserved microvasculature, you can detect microvascular disease with no evidence of epicardial disease, and you can detect the worst, which is combination of epicardial and microvascular disease. So, um, uh, you know, that kind of gives an overview of how 
pet, we believe pet is valuable in CAD. Now, where is flow reserve not helpful? There are a few re areas we don't use it but in post-cabbage patients because it's really tough to kind of separate graft anatomy from native. And these patients have diffuse disease. So we don't use it in that. We also don't use it in patients with severe cardiomyopathy, large infarcts, because your resting flows are going to be very low. And keep in mind that the resting flow is your denominator of the flow reserve. So for, I, I'll give you an example. Let's say your peak flow is one, which is very abnormal, but your resting flow is 0.5, your flow reserve becomes two. So if you only look at flow reserve, you may get fooled uh, in, in not realizing that the peak flow is pretty low. So we don't use it in those patients. Uh, severe renal dysfunction patients like end-stage renal disease also have quite a bit of microvascular issues. So it's not truly uh, of great advantage. So these are patients that the guidelines also recommend not to use. With that said, let's shift gears to talk about role of PET in viability and sarcoid. So all of, uh, all of you who do viability imaging uh, understand the concept of normal to progressive coronary disease leading to stunning and hibernation. And over, over time as CAD progresses, the myocardium becomes dysfunctional and becomes weak. So uh, the, the goal of uh, imaging would be, is the myocardium, which is akinetic or dyskinetic or severely hypokinetic, is it dead or is it alive? Is it hibernating? And so FTG PET is a, a, is a wonderful test, tech, a test, which I believe is a gold standard for PET uh, for, for myocardial viability imaging. And essentially radio label FDG enters the cell just like glucose, but they get trapped inside the cell due to molecular alterations. And that can be imaged uh, with uh, appropriate manipulation of glucose and insulin. So we have an extensive protocol at Henry Ford, like other institutions where our nurses check the glucose, do sliding scale and adjust it and then give FTG. I'm sure all of you do the same, but, uh, so we don't need to go into that. So if you compare PET to other technologies, which are widely used for viability, you can see that a PET enjoys extremely high sensitivity. Uh, now, again, as of nuclear techniques, the specificities are lower and we don't have time to get into it. I'm happy to talk about why that is during discussions. But in general, my bias when I teach my fellows is they'll ask me, Dr. Anand, should I do an MRI? Should I do a dubutamine echo or a nuclear scan or thing? What, how do we decide what to use? So the way I look at it is I don't want to miss any amount of viability, right? So I want to choose a test which has the highest negative predictive value. That means if the, it doesn't show viability, I'm very happy. So that comes with the test with highest sensitivity. And that's why I choose PET over other techniques. I don't like MRI the way it is done in our institution because we do scar imaging. I read MRIs too. So we do scar imaging. That is, we give gadolinium, we look at the scar, we don't give dobutamine. So that poses a problem for me. Where I trained for MRI, we used to do low dose dobutamine MRIs. We don't do that at our institution. So I don't like uh, scar imaging because there's no physiology. It doesn't tell us if part of the myocardium is viable and part of it is scar. So it makes it challenging. So here's a great case a patient of mine uh, who basically was turned down for cabbage. He's got heart failure, dyskinetic apex, uh, meaning that, uh, so the surgeons looked at his apex and said, well, this is this area is going to be aneurysmal. We're not going to operate on it. He had a completely occluded LAD, continued to have BT, so we brought, and heart failure. So we brought him in for a PET scan and you look at the apex, absent uptake completely, um, right? And look at the FDG uptake, dramatic increase in FDG. So, I think one of the things that this case teaches is, yes, you can use, you can look at the resting images, but you can't make viability decisions based on how thin the myocardium is, whether it's akinetic or dyskinetic, because the, this gentleman's ventricle completely improved. His apex came back completely after we opened up his LID. In contrast, this is another patient of mine with a uh, late presenting uh, LID STEMI who went for a pet viability, and you can see a matched defect. Uh, here, no FTG uptake in the area of severe perfusion. So it's nearly no point in revascularization and it's treated with medical therapy. So who do we send for viability imaging? There's a lot of uh, data on this. And, you know, we can't, we don't have the time to discuss viability and its role because there is a lot of controversy if viability is useful at all, like based on the STITCH trial. But our surgeons routinely order viability just like many other surgeons. So if you, if you know that you have significant coronary disease, 
and you have heart failure, particularly with a low EF, with significant resting wall motion abnormalities or perfusion defects, those are the patients who benefit maximal from viability. If you have multivessel disease and you have chest pain, we should not be doing a viability study because those patients need to be revascularized. Moving on to cardiac sarcoid. Uh, 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 and cardiac sarcoid is very prevalent in Detroit because of the African-American population. So we use PET and MRI quite a bit for sarcoid. So uh, as you know, sarcoid is underdiagnosed. Less than 5% of patients with cardiac sarcoid get clinically diagnosed, but at autopsy, close to 30% of them may actually have cardiac sarcoid. So we definitely miss an underdiagnosed sarcoid. So we have a very high clinical suspicion in our sarcoid program for a low threshold for utilizing advanced imaging. And if you look at the guidelines, the Japanese society guidelines, as well as the heart of them society guidelines, advanced imaging, including MRI and PET, have now made it into the guidelines. The original Japanese criteria from 2007 did not have PET imaging, but the most recent update have included cardiac PET uh, and the Heart Rhythm Society guidelines also have PET. Uh, all of you who do sarcoid imaging know that the biggest challenge is patient prep. We do extensive prep and actually we recently also implemented checking their beta hydroxybutyrate levels to ensure that they are truly ketotic because what you need to do for sarcoid is you need to really force the myocardium to get away from glucose. So we give three high fat diets uh, or high protein diets, less than two to three grams of carb. Then we make them fast with 12 hours. Then we give them heparin, everything to increase the amount of keto acids and decrease glucose. With all of this done, our success rate for PET imaging is around 90%. Even with all of this, about 10% of our patients don't have a diagnostic scan. And so you can see the diet is horrible diet particularly being a cardiologist, looking at this diet, it's pretty horrible, but these are the things that we ask our patients to eat. And so I think the key to success for FTG PET is excellent patient preparation. We, our team is like, they give three calls to the patient starting 72 hours before, reminding them of what diet to eat. We ask them to prepare a diet diary, and then we check the beta hydroxybutyrate when the patient comes to the lab. We have the results within within 45 to 50 minutes so that by the time they go for the FTG injection, we know if the scan needs to proceed or do we need to cancel it. If the, FT, if the beta hydroxybutyrate level is very low, that means they're not sufficiently in a ketotic state and the scan may not work. So here is an example of a uh, you know poor protocol uh, published. We, we do a very similar protocol to this. We don't do routinely whole body imaging. Um, we, we selectively do neck to adrenal imaging when, when requested, uh, just because of our volume and other things, we can't incorporate extended scans routinely. So here is very nice uh, car cartoon showing the different patterns of uptake with sarcoid. Uh, yeah, all of you who read it already are familiar. We ideally look for that mismatch pattern where you have a perfusion defect and uptake of FDG. But, you know, I'll be the first one to admit, I think FDG PET for sarcoid is very challenging to read. Uh, I know we run multidisciplinary uh, conferences and there are challenging cases, you know, up to 20% of cases where the MRI may show nothing and then the PET shows something. And then we have to make a decision if this is a true abnormality or it's lack of suppression of the, uh, uh, you know, glucose uptake by the myocardium. So it is a little bit challenging to read FDG PET. But when do you do PET versus MRI? And here's what I would say, right? So I would basically say that MRI has got superb spatial resolution, better than PET, and it's superb for scar, but it's really not good for inflammation or response to therapy. And that's where PET wins, hands down. So we routinely do MRI on all our patients. We start with an MRI because MRI has higher spatial resolution than PET. So if an MRI is squeaky clean, Unless you have a very high clinical suspicion for PET like VT or heart block or something like that, we don't do PET. But if there is a high suspicion, we will still move to PET. Every patient with a positive MRI gets a PET. So I think it should be MRI plus minus PET. Um, and PET is used routinely for following these patients. Uh, and we know that FTG PET uptake is associated with worse outcomes. So the degree of uptake, we do SUV max estimations, et cetera, um, but we primarily use still visual estimation. So I'll show you a case of mine, 61-year-old male presenting with heart failure symptoms. 
with some risk factors. His uh, EKG showed non-sustained BT, uh, which was clearly abnormal. So we took him for cardiac catheterization, showed minimal coronary disease. He had a chest CT, which confirmed bilateral lymphadenopathy, and it's very highly suspicious for sarcoid. And his echo showed severe LV dysfunction. So we went ahead and did an MRI, and here's a delayed enhancement, which was significantly abnormal. You could see extensive delayed enhancement in a non-coronary distribution pattern associated with significant right ventricular delayed enhancement, very su suggestive of sarcoidosis. So we made a provisional diagnosis of sarcoid, initiated him on therapy, but we, we, we but right after initiation of therapy, we actually put in a def defibrillator too, obviously. And the decision was, how do we follow this patient? So we said, well, let's get the baseline PET scan and then we can follow up him with PET. So here is his baseline PET scan. And you can clearly see he's got a significant perfusion defect in the septum and he's got patchy uptake of FDG. Uh, so he's got spotty. So this is classic pattern for active coronary inflammation. Not only is the LV, but the right ventricle is also involved right here. So it, it gave us the diagnosis of active inflammation. We initiated prednisone along with some methotrexate, brought him back six months later for repeat scan. And you can see very nice resolution of the perfusion defect and can only blood pool uptake in the LV and the RV. So you can see PET was uh, used to C response to therapy. And then what we do is we down titrate steroids by five to 10 milligrams every month and then repeat the PET scan. So very advantage is to use PET. Here's another case of, of mine, new onset heart block in a 68 year old female with known pulmonary sarcoidosis. They, had, they actually did a cardiac MRI and interestingly the MRI itself showed edema uh, we do uh, uh, we do T2 mapping, which is used for edema assessment, and it showed signs of inflammation. So here's her PET scan, clearly showing patchy uptake in the septum, along with the perfusion defect in the septum, so clearly positive for inflammation. And then after uh, prednisone 40 milligrams for three months, we brought her in for a scan, and you can see there is still a mild perfusion defect, but you can see that the degree of inflammation has decreased dramatically with primarily LV and RV blood pool in that area. Uh, and so we then weaned off prednisone due to some myopathy effects. So she was off prednisone completely and we brought her back three months later for a scan. And you can see persistent improvement in the PET scan with primarily LV and RV blood pool and almost near resolution of the septal defect. So you can see how PET it can be used to titrate this thing. So I believe that patients with sarcoid, where we are screening for cardiac sarcoid, sorry, should first undergo an ECG history and echo. If they have any symptoms, they should move to CMR and or FTG PET. If, what, what we tell our lab, clinics is if they have no symptoms, normal echo, normal ECG, no symptoms, we don't do advanced imaging. So finally, I'll finish up by uh, uh, talking uh, briefly about some novel applications for PET. And one of the areas, obviously, which is exciting for PET is its role in prosthetic heart valve infections. So we all know it's very challenging. I, you know, I do TEs a lot. And one of the major challenges is to detect early infection in a patient with bacteremia in the TE. Everyone can diagnose a big abscess or a big vegetation, but how do we know there is not early infection? And so this is where inflammatory imaging with PET CT has shown clear improvement in sensitivity over endocarditis criteria uh, without dramatic change in specificity. So I'll show you a case of a, 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 a patient with a aortic prosthesis showing significant inflammation around the prosthesis. There is also some areas in the sternum right here. And there is also an area in the right ventricle as you will see. And then there is right atrial uh, uh, area of in, uh, in, in two. So one of the challenges with prosthetic valve PET imaging is do not avoiding imaging very early after the device is placed. So, uh, you know, I think the literature is all over the place, but most people agree that imaging them within the first four to six weeks could give false positives because of the residual inflammation edema. And it also depends upon what material the surgeon uses, something like bio glue and other things have been shown to give false positive FTGs. So doing a detailed analysis of when the device was put in, what the material was used is all key before we jump into this. But for those who have had valves put in a while ago, who come in with bacteremia, 
where the TEE and transthoracic echo is not conclusive, I think FTG PET is truly valuable. And so uh, cases like this, where you, you see significant uptake of um, FDG, uh, and so the data on this is widely published now. And our European colleagues are far ahead of, uh, of the American colleagues in that they already incorporated FTG PET in their 2013 guidelines. And the most recent endocarditis guidelines published just a couple of months ago have given a class one indication for PET in, uh, in non-diagnostic echocardiographic data. So this is how the European uh, uh, Europeans have proposed utilizing PET-CT. That is, if you have a case of suspicion for prosthetic valve endocarditis, and it's possible that it's, you're not sure whether it's uh, possible because the ERT or transthoracic echo is not conclusive, you utilize PET to kind of help you guide towards whether it's neg positive or negative to make that decision. And so I will uh, summarize by saying I believe that uh, with the exponential growth in PET CT systems for oncology, particularly pretty much most of the hospitals in the United States have PET for oncology. Uh, I think cardiology, uh, as well as those of uh, you who practice it, I don't know how, how it is in India and other places, should be able to utilize this for cardiology too. Uh, FTG approval for PET isotopes for cardiac imaging is already there, and it's exciting that we're going to get some new isotopes, hopefully. The reimbursement profile in the United States is very good for cardiac PET. It, I hopefully have convinced you that it's got enhanced accuracy of respect to detection and prognostication of CAD. I believe it's the physiological gold standard for viability. I believe one of the biggest advantages is flow and flow reserve analysis to help figure out if patients have epicardial, microvascular disease or both, and utilizing these in uh, viability, inflammation, and infection imaging really leads to uh, uh, it being a much more comprehensive tool. So um, I will stop here and uh, be happy to uh, answer any questions if I can. Um, hello, this is Jyots now. Um, yeah. Yeah, wonderful talk. I have uh, two questions. One is, uh, what is the role of cardiac uh, pet tumor, uh, where do you see it uh, playing a role? How do you choose to do it? And the second question is um, FAPI imaging in cardiology. We know it's going to be very useful in oncology, but FAPI, uh, yeah. where do you see yeah, both so, of these? Yeah, so the PET MR, I think um, we don't have a PET MR scanner. I think there are very few uh, scattered in kind of the major, some of the big research institutions uh, in the uh, United States, I definitely know it's got uh, it has already been published and shown to have value, particularly for sarcoid because of fusion. How you can fuse the images. Obviously, there are nuances to how you do it, how you register the data, and everything like that. But uh, there are published studies showing that when uh, when you have the area of abnormality in the MRI correlating and fused registered with the area on PET that would be a great uh, great advantage where utilizing these kinds of fused imaging. Uh, obviously, having flow, I think the biggest challenge with MR, uh, you know, we don't do MR stress testing that much. We do have that option. We just don't do it. Um, the flow analysis with MR is a little bit more cumbersome. It's not well established that with PET. So if you had the power of MRI for coronary artery disease scar assessment and the physiology of stress PET and flow, that would be huge because PET can miss small scars, which MRI can pick up because just the spatial resolution, you know, MRI spatial resolution is like 1.5 millimeters compared to spec, which is four to six. So I, I see that that may be another uh, area where it may be very helpful cardiology wise. And then again, looking at, um, uh, uh, looking at things like intracardiac masses and other myopathies in the heart, inflammation, you know, we tell, you know, I'm sure you see this too, right? So not not every scan that we do for inflammation, which is positive, is sarcoid, right? It could be myocarditis. It could be inflammatory phase of arrhythmogenic right ventricular cardiomyopathy. So we see cases of positive PET scans in patients with other etiologies for uh, myocardial disease. And I think my MRI is obviously superb for that because looking at the pattern of delayed enhancement, you can make diagnosis of certain uh, certain kinds of myocardial disease. So when you combine that with the inflammation uh, superiority of PET, I think it carries value. Now, 
uh, I, I will admit that I am not, uh, we are not utilizing FAPI imaging. I, I know nuclear medicine. Uh, I've talked to my nuclear medicine colleagues and other things uh, and radiology. I think it's it's gathering uh, speed. So um, I, I would say at this time, I don't have an answer for you. I don't know where it will find a place in cardiology. So uh, I, I, I won't be able to elaborate on that. Dr. Anand, excellent talk. Um, this is Amol from, from Emory. Uh, we do have a, a cardiac MR, so, uh, but we, we have not utilized it much for, sorry, we have a PET MR, but we haven't utilized it much for <coughs> cardiac applications yet. Uh, there, are, there are challenges, as, as you know, with the rubidium generator being stuck in the PET CT suit and not, not in the uh, MR. Yeah. Uh, but anyway, very interesting talk, and, and we, we face similar issues in our day-to-day -day reads um, as well. Uh, one of the things I was curious about uh, was, do you use the, the rate pressure product correction uh, in your MFR when the rest flow is high? And, and if yes, uh, what are your criteria when to use it? And if no, why not? Yeah, I think, I think this is a, there, are, there are multiple factions in nuclear cardiology with that. And I'll tell you which faction I fall in. So obviously, if you look at the PET flow guidelines, they do give you an option of utilizing rate pressure product correction. But if I, if I, if I may just go back to this slide, because I, that will illustrate to you what I have implemented in our lab. Uh, let me just quickly go back here. Yeah, so, what, um, so just for the group, uh, obviously if your resting heart, resting flows are elevated like here, uh, as we show, for example, right, you know, when your resting flows are elevated, what can happen is if your stress flows are normal. Now, in this case, the stress flows are pretty high, so your flow reserve is okay. But what can happen is, as Amol pointed out, is sometimes you can have your resting flows be high and your stress flows just be normal. But because your denominator is high, your MFR can be artifactually reduced. So some people use RPP correction which is basically your double product. You take your resting systolic blood pressure, multiply that by your resting heart rate, and then utilize a constant like between 9,000 to 9,500. There's mm -hmm. a formula available where you can correct for the higher heart rate and blood pressure to kind of reduce your resting flow so that your flow reserve will be a norm. So the, the, you know, I belong to the group which basically says if your blood pressure is not elevated and we use 140 over 80, uh, I mean, people can argue about it, and if your heart rates are not elevated and we use 100 and above, we don't recommend rate pressure product correction. For the simple reason is you may tend to miss this group. So there are clearly patients with exertional intolerance, obesity, heart failure with preserved EF who have high resting flows who are unable to generate enough of stress flows and have, uh, and have this kind of issue with MFR. So this is now identified as a real issue. So I belong to the faction saying, take the patient for what they are and report the study. So we may have a scenario where we would say, we will not report myocardial flow reserve because the resting flows are artifactually elevated. Now, I do know my colleagues, some of them in nuclear cardiology, who correct for every, every case, they correct resting flow. I just believe that it's, that it's too aggressive and I, I don't think it makes physiological sense. So why would I want to correct the resting flow if the blood pressure is 120 and the heart rate is 80? So that's my take. Uh, I, I think I think people feel differently in different ways. So I, I would be curious to what you do. So we, um, so we also have a diverse group. We have several people reading. Some are from nuclear cardiology, some are from nuclear medicine. And uh, everybody has their own uh, school of thought. So I can't, uh, I can't comment for the whole group per se. Uh, but in general, we use it. Uh, we, we, we deploy it only when the resting flow is high. And then me personally, I don't deploy it in all the cases of, of resting high flow. Um, okay. I am kind of in your similar category, but I, I, I don't. Um, so I go with the, the blood pressure. If it is high blood pressure, um, and uh, if the heart rate is not too low, like if it's like 60 something, then there's no point in, but if it is in the eighties, uh, not necessarily, you know, 86, 88, 
then I I still uh, uh, implemented still it? because okay. it it could be reduced because of uh, medication rather than uh, true things and uh, but it's yeah. it's a it's a you know we we don't have a right answer and and that that causes um, uh, issues right. as I, well. So I agree, I agree, I, I, and I think the best one. So yes, there is no true answer how people do it. I think it's just different uh, different thought processes. Um, you know, as I see a lot, so I, I read a lot of echoes and I actually, when we send patients for hemodynamic assessment, we see these patients who have normal resting blood pressures and heart rate, their resting cardiac outputs are high. So because, you know, obesity is the third, third uh, leading cause of heart failure with preserved EF in the United States. And obese patients have high cardiac output state. And so because they have high cardiac output state, they, they've already partly exhausted their flow reserve, so they're not able to increase their flow that much. So I think by artifactually correcting the resting flow, I, I feel that we are, uh, we are uh, when we provide the data back to the referring doctor, we are basically giving them uh, a lull that the flow reserve is actually normal, whereas they probably have a problem in the flow reserve because the resting flows are high. Why the resting flow is high is what we need to figure out. It's a no-brainer if the blood pressure is 160, 170 that we're going to have to correct. But what if the blood pressure is normal? They're not anemic. Uh, their heart rates are not that high, yet the resting flows are high. I think that's a true pathological problem. And that's why I don't recommend. So in our lab, it's standardized. We don't recommend correction if the resting, if the blood pressure and heart rates are within the normal range um, and the resting flows are high. So we, we do leave it up to the clinician to say, if they feel uncomfortable, don't, re don't report the flow reserve. Just say, look at the peak flows. If the peak flows are normal, tell, tell them that they have no epicardial CAD, obstructive disease, and just put a statement saying MFR not reported due to technical issues. Yeah, I think that's an important thing that, that people just look at MFR and they don't look at the, the actual values of the rest and peak flow. Some of them don't even know what, what the normal ranges are. And so right. I think that that's, yeah. that's something we need to... Uh, increase the awareness and and the values are different for rubidium versus ammonia actually absolutely likely. absolutely uh, but uh, the other thing i wanted to uh, pick your brain on is is what kind of qaqc process do you do for for the mfr because it's 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 a highly involved and rigorous and and has so many nuances any small misstep can skew the values so i was just curious uh, how you go about it so we, you know, obviously we have a systematic way in which we ask the readers, obviously the texts do it, but in our lab, you know, we do, we have automated motion correction, but yet we have to, we run the dynamic series. We basically look at the region of interest, particularly the last 700 to 900 seconds to make sure that <clears throat> the data is within the ROIs. Uh, and then we basically look at the blood pool spillover uh, uh, bullseye things to look, uh, to make sure that is good. We look at the curb to make sure that there are no, um, you know, unnecessary blunting or second peaks and other things like that. Um, so, you know, kind of, I, I would say those would be my my ways. Typically, we look at it, but even with all of that, you 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 probably very well know that rubidium <laughs> a creep and spillover can cause significant problems. Yeah, yeah, so, yeah. Uh, I think I the way I look at flow is I use utilize. I think it's a great tool, but I utilize it when you know, along with the total clinical picture, I know we never hang our hats on that because it's a value. A value is a value. And it can be skewed, as you rightly said, in many different ways. Yeah. One last question before I don't want to hog, but I think there's another question in the chat as well. Yeah. Um, what uh, do you think uh, is happening uh, with CTA and uh, increasing utilization of CTA compared to uh, radionuclide MPI, be it PET or, or SPEC? Uh, especially SPEC seems to be decreasing, but a lot more role for you know CTA. And if it's negative, then you just don't get any other workup. Uh, any thoughts on that? Correct. Yeah, I think this is a... This is a challenge. I think part of it was because of the way the guidelines and the ACC and other things are kind of approach this, this concept. Obviously, I read CTs too. I think CT is phenomenal uh, in the low to intermediate risk patients to rule out epicardial CAD. But the big problem, I think what it has conveyed to people is that the moment people come in with chest pain and they do a coronary CT and it's normal, all the workup stops. And so, exactly. yeah, so what we're trying to tell people is, listen, 
epicardial disease, and that's the whole goal of the epicardial disease is only one aspect of patient's chest pain with regard in the coronary disease spectrum. So if they continue to have chest pain, you need to continue to investigate them further with uh, perfusion imaging and, uh, and other issues. So we tip, and if you look at it, there's really no contraindications for nuclear imaging. I think that's awesome, right? Both SPECT and PET, short of the patient refusing to lie under a scanner, there is no contraindication. Irregular heart rate, renal dysfunction, you know, devices, nothing prevents a person from getting a SPECT or a PET scan. Whereas with CT, you know, is the heart rate regular? Can they take beta blocker? You know, uh, you know, are there PVCs, PACs? What's the renal function? So there's there's quite a bit of issues. So I think we need to make sure that people understand that coronary disease is a spectrum. Microvascular dysfunction is significantly prevalent. Just a normal coronary artery uh, CT scan is not going to settle probably all the issues for all patients. I think there are a group which will clearly benefit from it. Yeah. But yeah. Uh, you know, definitely it's going to be it has to be complementary, and the right patient has to get the right test. Yeah, because there's increasing uh, awareness or, or at least increasing detection of this uh, INOCA, right? Ischemic non-obstructive uh, coronary artery, coronary arteries. Right. Uh, mm -hmm. Absolutely, that I think that's really missed by that. <clears throat> yeah, absolutely. I, I see a question in chat. Yes. It says, "Can cardiac PET imaging be used uh, for diagnosing reperfusion injury?" That's that's interesting, and I will tell you, it's not routinely used, but I'll tell you the challenge that I see with utilizing PET there. Um, so if you know that when you do PET in acute MI, and we've done it as a research fellow, I was I trained in Canada. We actually did PET in the setting of acute MI to look at area of uh, uh, area of edema, uh, area at risk, etc. And so the big challenge is uh, you are going to have a lot of you know extracellular water, edema, inflammation, macrophages. FTG is going to be taken up in that area. So it's going to be it's going to be dramatically abnormal in that area. So I, I find it challenging to assess what you know what is what is a salvage and what is not. I guess what you will have to do is you'll have to do a PET scan initially, and then probably wait till the scar is healed, and then do another PET scan uh, later on to see what the difference is. So I find it kind of a little bit challenging to do PET in that area. I, I don't know if other people have thoughts. I do feel that MRI has a role. You know, we do uh, we do MRI for acute MIs which come late and we see no uh, you know uh, no reflow phenomena and other aspects of it and i think it's easier probably for me to kind of interpret an mri uh, although gadolinium will still be a problem because the gad uptake will also be significant in areas of edema and other things so so i'm not sure that i see that pet has a role in reperfusion injury i, I don't know if other people feel differently And we're in the we're in the similar boat. Um, where, and, uh, I have one more comment about uh, you know exercise and and pet. People make this uh, statement that you know it's not possible. It's it's you need to modify that study, right? It's not possible with rubidium pet. With ammonia pet, I've done several uh, studies with exercise and and they're awesome. And ammonia also has the lowest of the radiation exposure amongst all agents. So. It's a little right. underserved uh, because of right. availability issues, but you know it is there uh, uh, with with newer uh, tabletop cyclotrons and all that. So, yeah, but I'm no, I'm, I'm hopeful about Florida's. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, no, I yeah, absolutely right. I think I think the reason I made that comment was most people don't have a cyclotron, and they have don't have the capability. I think rubidium generators are are going to be the way that PET is predominantly done in the United States. It's not going yeah, to be yeah. ammonia or things. I know the newer ion ionotex and other things yeah, have these yeah. portable cyclotrons, but short of all these big institutions, and I mean, obviously Emory is a big one where we have these cyclotrons, most of them will not be able to do it. I think the beauty of obviously flupiridase is you can pay people who have not been able to do PET imaging could now start doing unit dose PET imaging where they just order uh, you know, unit doses so that you can start a pet program in a small way, yeah. um, you know, rather than having to uh, invest huge amounts of periodic money with the generators. Yeah. Yeah, completely agree. But I was more in the Indian market. They use more uh, ammonia than rubidium, actually. So. Yeah, you're right. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> A 
excellent talk. I don't think uh, uh, we have any more questions. So I think uh, okay. we can, we can conclude. <clears throat> I appreciate the opportunity. Thank you very much. That was a great discussion too. Thank you. Thank you very Thank much, you. sir. Thank Indeed, you. An in talk on cardiac nuclear medicine, PET CT imaging. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Bye-bye, everyone. Bye. And then uh, we'll be uploading this on our YouTube channel and we'll send you a link when it's uploaded. Okay. Thank you. Appreciate it. Okay.